I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, something called model driven engineering, which is a subfield in the software engineering. Uh, so it's about developing software, about uh, an interesting new way, different way of developing software. So let me perhaps say a little bit about this idea of abstraction first, because that's been around in computer science for ages. Computers really only know zeros and ones. That doesn't really work for humans, right? So thinking through a problem in zeros and ones is really, really, really difficult. So what have we done? Well, we started building a language on top of that, right? Originally, there's a language where you said, well, there's certain commands that the computer can do. These commands we can encode as a number. That means we can encode them using zeros and ones. So a sequence of those numbers becomes a program. We kind of went, okay, well, that's a little difficult still, right? I still have to think of these numbers. So we started producing something called assembler, which is a slightly higher level language. It's essentially taking those number codes and assigning a word to each one. So we now write, rather than writing seven, we write add. That's still complicated because you've got to write out every single little step and everything in there. And so eventually people started developing what they call higher level programming languages. Things like Fortran, C++, Java, these kinds of languages. And what they do is they give us a language that much more readable and much more writable and much more understandable to a well-trained human being. There's still a problem with that, okay? Which is you've got to be a technically trained person to use these languages. Because what these languages are doing is they're allowing you to express a problem and a solution to the problem that you have in terms of a computer. So you've got to say, computer do this, computer do that, now do this. But actually the problem that you had was, I want to manage bank accounts. I want to manage mortgages. I want to simulate cell biology. I, you know, problems that the computer doesn't have a clue about, basically. So in the programmer's head, there needs to happen a lot of translation from these domain-specific concepts into something that explains them to the computer. And all of that translation gets lost. Maybe let me try and show that to you a little bit in, an, in, in, in a simple example. What I have here is a simple development environment, as many uh, software developers will, uh, will use in their sort of day-to-day -day work. And I've written a simple program in Java uh, that allows me to play Minesweeper games. Now, depending on your age, you may or may not know what Minesweeper is. So I've, I've brought it up here as an example. It was this sort of game, I think it was, came with, with pretty much all the old computers um, where you've got this sort of rectangular grid here and each element on the grid potentially hides a mine. And your goal is to find all the mines without stepping on one and exploding them. And so the, the way you do this is you click on one of these cells and it then tells you whether there was a mine there or not. And if there wasn't a mine, then all is fine. And as in this example here, you might see a little number that tells you how many mines are in any adjacent cells. Now, in this case, that doesn't help me much because it tells me there's one mine, but, but, but you know, not a lot else. So let me click somewhere else to get a, get a bit of a start on this. And you see, oh, this was better. I've clicked on an empty uh, cell here where there's no mine. I just got lucky. Um, but I got so lucky that I actually found that there's lots of empty cells everywhere around and it'll automatically open all of those up and how I can go and I can work out with these numbers where the mines are. Now, the, the goal of, of this video isn't to explain Minesweeper to you, so I'm going to kind of stop at this point as much as I love playing Minesweeper, Minesweeper and I'm going to look a little bit at the code, right? So let me close this Minesweeper uh, application here. Let's have a look at the code. So here you can see on the left of the screen, you can see all the various pieces, all the various files that I've built to build this, this, this program. Now, Minesweeper is by no stretch of the imagination a complicated piece of software, right? It's still a fairly simple piece of software. But you can still see, you know, as I developed this, I sort of had to write uh, quite a number of files. Okay, and if I look into some of these files, this is one of the classes. It happens to be the one where everything starts. And you can see there's a lot of code going on. Now, a key question you might wonder about with Minesweeper is, what are the rules of Minesweeper? And how do I change them? Right? If I want to build a slightly different version of Minesweeper with slightly different rules, how do I do this? Right? Because that's in the end what you care about. As a game developer, you care about the rules of the game. You don't necessarily care so much about how to explain to Windows or Linux or Mac OS or Android 
how to get the thing on the screen, you, in the first instance, you're interested in designing the rules of the game. And you want to be able to see them and you want to be able to change them. The problem with this code, of course, is we've got nine classes or so here and the rules could be anywhere in there. Okay. In fact, there's all kinds of other stuff in this code, right? So this code here that we see here, it's got stuff about the menu. Uh, it's got stuff about initializing fields. But then in there, if I look at this again, it creates tables and it creates listeners to mouse events. So again, that's about user interaction and not so much about the rules. So it's all kinds of things are intermixed, right? And it's really difficult to find what the rules of the game are. Okay? In an MDE approach, what we would take is we would take a step back from this and we'd say, actually, let's not worry about all of these details. Let's abstract away from them, just like Java abstracts away from the machine code. Let's abstract away from that and build ourselves a modeling language and then write a model that captures only the information that we care about. Okay, so let's look here at a different way of representing Minesweeper in this file here. So this is a little modeling language I built and a little model in that modeling language I built to describe Minesweeper. And in fact, it turns out that from this model, I can generate automatically all the Java code that's needed for, for running Minesweeper. Okay. And what this does is it has these, these field commands here, which allow me to define what fields there are, what rectangular fields. Let's open up one of those. So the easy field here, it basically says, well, it's 10 cells wide, it's 10 cells high. And then it's initialized using this fill field thing, which is defined down here. And it has takes one parameter, which is the number of mines that we want to set up in our, in, in our uh, field. And we're setting this to 10. So in an easy field, we have, it's 10 wide, it's 10 high, and it has contains 10 mines. Okay. Now the other fields are set up with different sizes, etc. Let's have a look at briefly at what this field field thing looks like. Well, it sort of says, okay, I'm going to use various strategies for initializing the field. I'm going to start by randomly initializing this many elements, cells in that this field with mines. Then I'm going to use this context rule to say, I'm going to put bordering mine cells anywhere where there is already a mine cell somewhere and, um, and they, they're going to sit around that. And the bordering mine cells are the ones that show these little numbers when you discover them. And then everything else gets filled with empty cells. Okay. And that's the basic things that you need to know about setting up a Minesweeper field, right? So you don't need to know more. You don't need to care about how this setting up of these cells actually happens or anything like that. You just want to say, that's the rules. Okay. So we've mentioned these different types of cells. So obviously we need to define them and that's what the cell command is for. Right, so we can define an empty cell, we can define a bordering mine cell, and we can define a regular mine cell. Basically all set up using these mine states thing here, because the key idea in this modeling language is to say, well, actually, each of these little cells that we have here has a little state machine attached to it. Okay, so it can be in one of a number of states, and depending on what the user does with the cell, and depending on maybe what else happens, it might change its state. Okay, and so it's useful to just basically be able to do the rules of the game, I guess, are what states there are and what the transitions between those states are. And so we define what this state machine is here using this mind states thing here. And you can see that pretty much the, the, the state machine is the same for empty cells, mind cells, bordering mind cells, because essentially they react to user input in the same way. They go from this undiscovered state, this hidden state to a discovered state, and maybe you can add a flagged state if you wanted to. Um, the only difference is that they might be showing slightly different things on uh, when they are discovered, and there might be a different thing that happens, right? When you click on the mine, things will explode. When you click, not don't click on the mine, nothing will happen other than discovering the cell. And then we say, okay, well, what are the states? Well, it starts with this hidden state. And what's important about the state? Well, what's important is what it looks like. It looks like a button with no text on it, like an empty button. And what happens? when you click on it or when other things happen, right? So transitions that move it to, to another state. But now we can do things here, right? Quite easily, we can say, oh, actually, let's not go to the flat state when you right click on, on the cell. Let's forbid that. Let's not introduce this flat state, right? The flat state is where you can right click on a cell and you can sort of put a little marker there to kind of go, I think there might be a mine here, but I'm not quite sure. And if I save this here, then it regenerates code for me. Now let me just run this. And there we are. There is my Minesweeper. And now I can try and right click on these, but nothing's going to happen. But I can continue to sort of left click and play the game. Okay. And if I make this thing available again here, it regenerates all of this code for me and I can run it again. 
And now I should be able to right click on here, see, and I've got the flag this cell here to say there might be a mine there, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so, so really easily I've just changed the rules directly in this. Imagine if I had had to try and do that in my Java code, I would have probably had to touch three or five, four files, remember the changes that I made, make sure that I make them consistently, etc. None of which I had to worry about in this case. Okay. Another thing that I get is, and you might have spotted that briefly, if I comment this out again for a moment here, you will see suddenly this part of, the, of, of my model gets this yellow underline. I go on this, this says, this state cannot be reached. So this is only possible because in my model, I have made it explicit that there's this idea of a state and that there's this idea of things moving between states. And therefore, clearly, it's not a good thing if, a, if I've defined a state that cannot be reached. But because I've got these things explicit in my language, I can actually do this analysis and I can actually check for it and I can give better feedback to people developing these things. If this was a language that only allowed me to build Minesweeper, it'd be a bit silly. Okay, so the, the trick to do in MDE is to build languages that meet, get, find that sort of sweet spot between being specific enough that, that the abstractions are useful to a particular group of people and that they allow us to do give compact expressions of the things that we actually care about and allow us to do useful analyses and validations like the one that I've just shown, while not being so specific and narrow that we can only write ever write one program in the language. Okay, And finding that kind of balance is a tricky thing. And so one other thing you can, for example, define with this language is this game of life here. With a scale up, I mean, you know, obviously for a simple cell program like this, you can see this working, but we've got programs out there with millions of lines of code, haven't we? I mean, how, how would it change that sort of development? No, actually, actually, it scales up really well, right? Because, because what it does is effectively reduce the number of lines of code that you write, right? So every line of code I've written here in my modeling language translates into n lines of code. I'm not quite that many perhaps in this example, but potentially quite a few lines of code in, uh, in, in the real sort of programming language. But are you not making it so it's less less flexible process by, by you know, having to write a language for each one and then obviously constraining people within the, what that language can do? Yes, of course, of course, right? So you are reducing flexibility um, but that's that's always been true, right? In this process, well, so so there are things you can write in assembler that are difficult or impossible to write in a higher level programming language, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because more often than not, what it actually does is reduce the number of ways in which you can shoot yourself in the foot. We'd like to thank Scalar for supporting this computer file video. If you, like me, love to learn something new, then you're going to love Scalar. As a resource for upskilling, they cater to everyone, no matter what skill level, which means that you're going to get a lot out of their programs. Whether it's their interview hacks, the mentorships, or curated computer science courses, every techie should know about Scalar. Scalar's programs are flexible and care for you. Choose a starting point based on your expertise and become a part of their thriving community. It's easy to get started. You can take part in a free live class by simply following the link in the video description. The live classes are clear and accessible and you can simply sign up for whichever you fancy. You want to learn the basics of machine learning in under 20 minutes? Build a chatbot or take a course in the fundamentals of system design. They have it all. If you watch this video because you're already a coder, then take your coding to the next level with a Scalar program tailored to your existing expertise. A look at the website, the Scalar website shows Scalar alumni work at top global corporations, and you can see their programs and events in software development and data science. Remember, there's a link in the video description, and thanks again to Scalar for supporting this computer file video.